Welcome everyone um, to our executive series webinar in partnership with ClearSource today about building a better bilingual hiring strategy. Very relevant topic for all of us. As the world continues to recover from the pandemic and now deal with the great resignation, we have found many global organizations are anxious to establish processes for quick and efficient hiring, especially in bilingual markets. My name is Brigham Tomko and I'm the CEO here at Immersion. And I'm thrilled to discuss this topic today with two other experienced industry professionals. Uh, our head of people here at Immersion, Paul Thatcher, and co-founder of ClearSource, Nate Spears. Give you a quick uh, background on our, our two panelists today. Paul, for more than a decade, has helped companies scale and utilize technology to be successful in their investments most important of which he believes to be people. He led the hyper growth of Jive Communications to nearly a thousand employees, including expansion into Brazil, Mexico, Canada, and a 700 seat contact center in Guatemala. He's an expert in talent acquisition strategies and building teams, both domestically and internationally. Paul, thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here. Uh, Nate Spears has over 25 years of experience in the call center BPO industry. He's the co-founder and launched ClearSource in 2008. ClearSource provides a premium customer care services for phone, chat, and email support, as well as other back office functions on behalf of other companies. His company has grown over 3X in the past 12 months. It has a thousand employees spread across the US and abroad and an annual attrition rate of less than 30%. That is pretty amazing uh, compared to industry norm of 60 to 100%. And absenteeism is less than 5%, even though they don't use an attendance policy. Uh, Nate, thanks for joining us as well. It's my pleasure, Brigham, thank you. So great to have you with us and lend your expertise. Um, for those of you on the webinar, if you'd like to ask any questions, please feel free to do so in the chat. Um, and I'll look at those and, and sprinkle them in throughout the discussion. but. Let's jump right into our discussion topics today. So first off, um, why is it so important to specifically discuss bilingual hiring strategy? Our customers and workforces are becoming more and more global and hiring processes must transform to meet the demands of an increasingly diverse bilingual workforce. And uh, Nate, can you share some insights on that for us? Absolutely. As a business process outsource company, you know, clearly we service a variety of clients across various industries and our value add is our ability to bring people in who can be subject matter experts for the various types of services that we provide. And what we found is, is that when you look at the global market, right, in any given geographic area, you're going to have variation in wage pressure um, in dynamics around unemployment rate and things like that. And so what we found is that in order to remain competitive, we've had to look even outside of, not only outside of Utah within the US, but we've had to look globally for opportunities to be able to provide our services in an effective, but also cost effective manner. And so what we've seen is a huge globalization of business process outsource work. And a good example of this, uh, I was speaking with someone at an event last week, and they're actually a company headquartered here in Utah that has a software application that's um, basically being utilized by restaurants. And support for this software application uh, is being handled by a firm out of the UK that has um, agents in countries throughout the world that actually take these calls. And so it's just a reminder to me that this is not like call center work was 20 years ago when we had on-premise systems and people were working in the office. Uh, these days, you've got people working from home, really from anywhere in the world. And as that is the case, you know, we found more and more need to be able to speak to the bilingual aspect of that hiring strategy. Yeah. Thanks, Nate. That's a, that's a great point. A lot of things are changing and changing quickly as evidenced by your company's growth, but also, you know, the industry numbers, you know, outsourcing looks at growing almost 50% over the next five years. So this has become a, a bigger and bigger issue. 
Um, Paul, in your experience hiring for contact centers, how did you see the need to prioritize testing for language ability as part of that bilingual hiring process? Yeah, it's a great question. So in our business, where I was previously, our contact center, our, our call center was not viewed as a cost center. It was viewed as part of the revenue generation of the company. So we, we differentiated our business based on um, our customer support. And in order to do that, it had to be a premium experience for our customers. And the ability of our agents to speak the language well was absolutely critical. So we, we chose to build our call center in Guatemala. We scaled it from one employee to about 700 employees over four to five years. And one of the challenges that we ran into is in order to maintain the quality of bilingual speaking ability, we had one person in that call center that we trusted to screen for language ability. He was our head of operations, our most, our most critical leader. And he, he was the bottleneck. No one could get hired unless they went through uh, him to screen their language ability. And that became difficult when we were hiring at scale and hiring very rapidly because um, it took him away from the other responsibilities that he had to do. Now, in a lot of call centers, you don't have one person to screen language ability, but the more people who are screening for language ability, the, the greater risk of inconsistency in speaking. And I've thought so many times, if, if we would have had a technology product that could have um, lifted the burden of, of language screening from that key employee, and we could have done it through artificial intelligence or through technology, uh, we would have jumped at the, at the chance to use that. It's part of the reason why I came to Immersion because of that experience. Yeah, well, I was just with uh, my mom last night. She had a flat tire and she has one of the largest insurance companies in the world. My poor mom, who's almost 70, was on the side of the highway for two and a half hours because they couldn't communicate with the phone center reps that were after hours. So this is a pain we deal with in business, but our customers uh, and customers' customers are, are the ones dealing with the end pain and, and we wanna increase their customer satisfaction. So yeah, I, I agree having that in place is important. Um, I think this leads nicely into our next topic of you know, what you'd be looking for in a hire. Nate, you've done extensive research on how to select for capacity and commitment. Have you developed an outline for identifying what really to hire for in uh, your call center employees? Yeah, absolutely, Brigham. You know, we've found that someone's not going to be successful in this role unless they have both the commitment or determination to succeed as well as the capacity to actually do the job. And I think any more good is not good enough. You've got to ensure that the people that you're bringing on are able to make that transition from competence to mastery. And so as we're screening applications and applicants, we're trying to ascertain whether they actually have that potential to be able to master the material that's going to be taught to them in training and be able to become subject matter experts and working with customers. So much of this comes down to how well we've defined the role that we're looking to hire for. And we have a process that we use here at ClearSource whereby we create something called a role definition. Uh, the purpose of the role definition is to eliminate any confusion around the expectations that will be part of that person in their role. And so we, we in defining a role, seek to answer three questions. The first question we're looking to answer is, why does this role exist? Now, for customer service representatives, that might be self-apparent, but for us, it's really tying that to our company's collective goal of happy clients, healthy financials, and successful staff. The second component of the role definition is simply outlining the core responsibilities of the role or how those core responsibilities are suited to the skill set of the individual that we're looking for for that role, and that really speaks to the candidate profile. The third component of the role definition is we've got to have a clear understanding of what success looks like in the role. So for us, that's identifying which KPR, KPIs matter most uh, for a customer service representative. Those are going to be behavioral based KPIs such as quality assurance score, attendance, et cetera. And we put clear metrics around those specific uh, KPIs 
so that there is no ambiguity around what it is that we're looking for in that role. With the role clearly defined, we can then go out and identify people who have the capacity to meet the expectations of the role and who want what we want. We want to help each person see how if we as a company are successful in achieving our collective goal, that that creates a path for everybody on the project to be able to get where they want to go, which is whatever it is they're hoping to have happen in their own life. Um, and so I, I think for us, that's a big part of that process is how well you define the role really lends to being able to create a candidate profile that makes the screening process so much more effective. Yeah, well, and I think that ties right back to some of those numbers we talked about at the beginning that your attrition and absenteeism are so much lower because you do look at, you know, these roles seriously. I think sometimes people are like, oh, it's customer support. We know what that means. But taking the thought and finding the right people is really your numbers, you know, prove that out and in, in the way you've been able to operate the business. Um, you know, and I, th I think it's interesting in bilingual hiring where you have internal versus external communications you're hiring for with that bilingual capability. And um, in many cases with bilingual, if they don't speak the language, they can't have the job. And so that helps you sometimes prioritize a, a language screening to be at the very top of the funnel when you're in a bilingual situation, because if they have a lot of these other skill sets, but then can't communicate in the language of business, whatever it is for your company, it, it almost, um, you know, it almost doesn't matter. And then in, in different companies, even in call center, but thinking more about, uh, you know, hotel and hospitality and uh, banking and finance, you know, someone with very little English could do cleaning in a hotel. Someone with a little bit more English could be part of the serving staff in a, rest a restaurant. And with a little bit better could be at uh, front desk and the best might be concierge. And being able to assess them on the, in the initial part of the um, screening to see which jobs they might be eligible for is another great use of, of assessment in, uh, in bilingual hiring. So you can funnel them into the potential job opportunities at the beginning. And I, I saw this with, uh, as I was building a call center and then a software development firm in the Philippines where we had different roles. And if you know an engineer, for instance, couldn't speak very well, they would have to be put on a team with a very strong team lead who could speak well, but they probably couldn't be the team lead themselves. So using language as a differentiator to fit into different roles has been something I've added to that process over time as well. Um, kind of, I'd like to open the discussion up a little and, and, and Nate and Paul kind of jump in as you have different ideas here, but with all the changes we've talked about in the, and the industry growing, remote hiring, uh, globalization of workforce um, and customers, what are some of the trends or shifts you're seeing in the bilingual hiring market? I'll jump in real quick, Brigham, on this one. I yeah. think one of the things that I've seen that's changed over time is that there used to be some kind of prohibition on utilizing languages other than English on the call floor or things like that. And what I found is, is that as we've shifted to a work from home environment, right, where these coaching conversations are happening in Zoom or Microsoft Teams, um, that a lot of team members are much more comfortable if they're able to speak in their native language with their supervisor. And I think that that certainly creates opportunities for authenticity, comfort, and a willingness to be able to dig deep and discuss the things that need to be discussed when you're not forcing them to use a language that even though they speak it well, there's just something about uh, being able to converse in your native language that, that certainly makes it easier to build trust and work through maybe some challenges that agent might be facing. So I think for us, just uh, simply being aware of that need and accommodating that need for our, for our work from home teams has been uh, very helpful for them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, one of, one of the biggest transformations that I'm seeing is how the digital transformation is causing companies to, re, to rethink how they staff. So when, when we got to the point in COVID where um, everyone was working from home, companies started to ask, well, if, if our current staff can work from home and we're still successful, can we move some of this staff to lower cost locations? And because of that, you're, 
you know, the projections are that the call center, contact center industry is set to double in size from like 250 billion to 500 billion over the next six to seven years. So bilingual hiring and hiring in these, in these locations where you have fewer native English speakers is just gonna continue to be um, a real driver in, in our industries. And I think those companies who can hire well and compete for talent and who can differentiate from the competition by creating an excellent customer experience, they're gonna be, they're gonna be the winners in the long run. Paul, just to, to piggyback on what you just said, you know, one of the things that we noticed, if you go way back to the, to the early 2000s, when offshoring started to become a big thing for US-based corporations, what happened is, is there was this initial push to India because it had the infrastructure and an educated workforce that was able to take those calls. But one of the challenges that we saw was that, you know, um, India, although there are many English speakers, was largely from a cultural perspective, very UK oriented, right? And so there was this, I think, initial backlash among US consumers that began to immediately associate all offshore with India. And what we saw in the later 2000s was as the Philippines started to, to develop a stronger um, kind of national infrastructure that was catering to the BPO industry, uh, the, the Philippines, in comparison to, to India, is a bit more U.S.-centric, as, as again, opposed to India, which is a bit more U.K.-centric. And um, the accent's a little bit, I think, easier for Americans, and they were um, able to converse about cities and states in the U.S. and cultural events in the U.S. and things like that, that I think made it easier for that transition. And I think the, the point to take away from all of that is it's not enough just to say someone speaks English, but also to look for kind of cultural orientation. And, um, and, and I think that certainly makes the process of creating that exceptional customer experience uh, much easier when there's that natural cultural uh, orientation towards service and toward your customer base. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to jump a little bit out of order here, Paul, but um, I think there's something we were discussing earlier um, around technology and the hiring process. One of the trends we see is when I was doing offshoring and outsourcing during the last decade, all of our employees still came into the office for their interviews. So it was bilingual hiring, but it was bilingual in person. Um, and so the trend has been to, it is bilingual hiring, but it's remote. Um, Paul, maybe you could talk to how you're seeing technology assist and improve in, in the bilingual hiring process, you know, along that trend of remote, remote bilingual hiring. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think companies are looking for ways to replace that in-person experience. So one of the trends that we're seeing is companies are turning more to assessments, pre-hire assessments. Those could be um, psychological, behavioral, personality assessments could be language assessments. And um, by getting additional data in that, in that pre-hire process, companies are leveraging technology to make better decisions. In the call center space, um, there's so much competition for talent that we see call centers pushing for same day offers, you know, 24 hour from first interview to offer. And, um, and again, assessments and technology, AI is facilitating that, that speed to offer. One of the other things we're seeing is, and this is a really positive trend, is a desire to remove bias from the hiring process. We're looking for equality and, and consistency and using artificial intelligence, as long as it's a, a well-trained model, it takes the human, the human bias elements or at least it reduces the human bias elements in, in that hiring process. And uh, there's, there's a whole lot more, but those are some of the first that come to my mind of, of how technology is, is impacting. Yeah, well, you brought up competition. So with remote hiring, the pool of who you're competing against for that talent um, increases a lot. In, in a really competitive hiring market, Nate, what are some of the things that you guys have done to... Uh, differentiate and stay competitive now that it seems like everyone's competing for for those remote hires you know I, I, I obviously you know one of the things that that I think is part of our strategy is we want to be one of you know 
one of the highest paying uh, in, in our industry and kind of where we're located. But I think beyond that, creating an, a work environment that once people join it, they don't want to leave. You know, there's a quote that, and I'm going to, I'm going to murder it, but it's a Richard Branson quote where he says, you know, companies should be giving their people all the skills, the tools, everything they need to go anywhere and be successful, but then to treat them so well, they'd never want to leave. And for us, the value add that we create for our employees is we've developed a leadership training program that teaches our people how to lead without direct authority or without force or compulsion. And I think that for us has been a game changer because you start building relationships of trust that allow for healthy conflict, which then leads to commitment. And any of you are familiar with the, the five dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni, I'm borrowing a lot from that. But then you start to create a culture of accountability. And, and, and when people are in that kind of an environment where they see everybody working toward that collective goal and recognizing how they benefit, I mean, it, it makes a huge difference, right, in terms of being able to get people excited about joining your organization. Now, we're relatively unknown. And so we utilize social media a lot in order to put forth these principles and kind of set ourselves up so that people who never heard of ClearSource might say, oh my gosh, this sounds refreshing. It sounds exciting. It's something I think I'd like to be a part of. And we know it's working because the overwhelming majority of our new hires are coming from employer referrals. And so I think so much of that alone speaks to the effectiveness of our strategy in terms of creating a place where everybody gets to go home at the end of the day. I say that metaphorically because they're all working from home, but they get to go home at the end of the day and say to themselves, you know, honestly, I love my job. And uh, that's my whole kind of mission and vision for what I hope everybody experiences at ClearSource. Yeah, thanks, Nate. I see a question came in from our Q&A that um, you know, was related to something we were discussing earlier, um, Nate. Um, they asked, what language assessments do you recommend? Um, obviously, Immersion is a language assessment company and you use yeah. those, but I'd love to maybe talk about specifically and generally, you know, any thoughts you have on how to choose the right language assessments for, for your bilingual hiring. That's a great question. So um, the reality is, is that we have been using immersion for some time, and that is the language assessment process that we use. Um, we, we like it because of its AI capabilities and that it's continuing to, to grow and become more effective. But I think for us, the, the reality is, is that's part of the kind of the pre-screening process our strategy is to get as many applications as possible so that we can be as selective as we need to be so that we never have to compromise on candidate quality in order to fill a hiring class, right? So for us, you know, we tend to shoot for about a 5% higher rate. So we're getting 20, you know, 20 applications for each person we bring on. And what we're looking for in there is how, how can I more effectively go through those 20 applications to find that right person Immersion is a big part of that process because it tells me, okay, who, who do I have who really has kind of from a language perspective, the capacity to do this job? And then from there, I'm going to narrow it down based on culture, uh, commitment, and those other things that we've talked about. Yeah. yeah I think that's great. Um, Paul, I'm going to ask you a, another question that was asked, um, and you can relate it to assessment as well. And, and you just brought this up, Nate, in terms of you like to get a lot in the funnel so you can get the right fit. They asked, how, how are recruiters finding bilingual candidates besides LinkedIn? Any thoughts, Paul, and then Nate on that of, you know, how do we fill the funnel a little bit? I know it's not the key topic here, but it's one I'm sure many of our listeners are thinking about right now is how do I get better candidates in that funnel? You know, I, I like what Nate said is using social media and putting your culture out front. Um, can, just like just like customers are looking for a fantastic customer experience, employees want the best employee experience. And so the more you can put your culture up front, make it visible, um, you know, focus on your your glass story views, you know, um, anything that you can do to to transparently communicate the the benefits of working in your company is um, not only will generate um, initial interest, but also will create um, more discussion around around your business. Yeah, LinkedIn is a is a key tool. 
I think effective job postings is critical. You know, I, I love what Nate said earlier about making sure you have the right job pro profile that clearly identifies what, what what will be expected of the of the employee. And then at the end of the day, it's it's great recruiters. You know, people who can who can go and mine and find these candidates. That's our uh, our social media strategy is heavily focused on targeting people in the in their native language. So. Um, yes, there's a lot of stuff in English. There's also content that's in, uh, you know, if I'm in the Philippines in Tagalog, but on top of that, you know, there are going to be cultural nuances around humor or things that get people interested in a job post that are going to be specific to the way they do things. And I might look at it and say, that doesn't make any sense to me, but if you were to go the, there, uh, it resonates with people. And so making sure that you're, we have an in-house kind of marketing and, and sourcing team, but making sure your team is tapped into, tuned into those things that really get people to notice your posts um, can really mean a lot to the overall social media marketing strategy. And so we're very heavy in Facebook. We're getting into TikTok and we're doing competitions uh, in TikTok that get people to uh, to notice clear source and things like that. So it's a, uh, wherever the eyeballs are, that's, that's where we go. Yeah. Yeah. Recruiting is all about sales and marketing, right? You got to get, get the message out there and, and attract them. Um, probably just, uh, we have time for one more question. Um, we'll do it from the, the Q and a here. And, uh, the question was, how do you help recruiters who might be hesitant using AI and using tools to replace, you know, humans in that process? I mean, my initial thought is just to test it. There, there's so little risk to just try a new process, test it out, you know, take a sample of 10 or 15 or 20 candidates, give them an AI language assessment and then compare it to your internal screening process and just check on the results. Um, there are certainly gains by using technology. And one of the, one of the most simple is that you can screen hundreds if not thousands of candidates at the same time, and you're not bottlenecked by by the human. So, if if you can calibrate it and get comfortable with it, the the upside is huge. Nate, any anything you'd add to that? Absolutely. I, I don't think that question is really much different from the whole idea of AI. You know, and Google's got some really great stuff going on replacing customer service representatives. And I think it's something that some people in our industry view as a threat. And I don't see it any differently then the advent of websites becoming self-service resources for customers over the last 10 years. And what we're going to see is, is a shift in specialization where the low hanging, easy to answer questions are going to be answered either by a website or by a chat bot or other AI tools. And we're gonna see our agents need to develop greater and greater specialization. And what you'll notice is, is maybe the total number of people handling inbound customer service calls is not much different today than it was 20 years ago, but the types of questions they're answering and the skill set required to be successful in those roles is really what's changing. And so whether it's a customer service representative or a recruiter, in effect, it's really kind of the same thing where, yes, they're going to be need to be more specialized, but at the same time, um, they're going to be focused much more on other aspects of the recruiting process rather than simply assessing whether or not someone has a certain language capacity. Yeah. yeah I think that's a, that's a great point um, that there's the language is important and bilingual, but the other parts of the, the process and abilities are, are key as well. I'll, I'll kind of wrap up answering a little bit of the last question that popped in on the Q and a while I wrap up as well, but uh, you know, one of our listeners was asking about uh, Korean hiring, and just as a fun side note, Immersion will be releasing a Korean speaking assessment um, soon, so that will be out there. But they mentioned, you know, things you've already mentioned, Native. You know, language is a great pre-screening tool, but in the end, customer service reps are a conduit and a representative of uh, our company and our customers' companies as well. And so all the things, you know, that Nate mentioned earlier in the um, you know, in the discussion, I think are very important in that recruiting process. Just because it's a bilingual hire, language isn't enough. You need to hire a good employee that can serve the job, but language is a condition precedent to 
that person being you know, successful in their, um, in their assignment. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I think uh, obviously Nate and Paul and I love this topic. I think it's one very timely uh, for all of you as well. And we could continue for, for hours, but we wanna respect your time. Uh, we thank you for joining us. And as our way of thanking you uh, for the time to attend, we'll be sending you a free copy of our ultimate guide to bilingual hiring in 2022. Um, it'll provide you some great insights. We'll also be sending along a chance to take one of the immersion automated um, speaking tests for free. And again, thanks for coming. We hope to see you on our next webinar in November on the 17th. The topic will be human raters versus AI, the battle for reliable language testing. And Nate and Paul, uh, thank you again for joining us and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Bergen. Thank you, Paul. See ya.